Salams, this is People's Dispatch and you're watching the Daily Debrief coming to you from our studios here in New Delhi with me, Siddhant Ani. Uh, we're talking on the show today about a massive mobilization of workers, farmers and agricultural laborers in India who are on the streets uh, demanding more from the Narendra Modi-led BJP government. Uh, we also talk about the increasing cycle of uh, Israeli state oppression against Palestinians, particularly in the context of the holy month of Ramzan. And finally, why the US justice system is refusing to relook at uh, Mumia Abu Jamal's long pending uh, plea for bail as well as his uh, trial and incarceration in the first place. Uh, first up, our top story for the day. On Wednesday, April the 5th, thousands, tens of thousands, in fact, of farmers and workers from across India came to the country's capital, New Delhi, to protest the central government and its anti-farmer and anti-labor policies. The rally was organized under, under the banner Mazdoor Kisan Sanghash Rally, uh, which translates into uh, worker, uh, farmer, agitation rally. It was held at the massive Ramlila Maidan grounds in New Delhi and protesters demanded relief from inflation, a legal guarantee for a minimum support price for agricultural produce, main crops that is, minimum wages for all workers to the tune of around US dollars 300 per month, relief from debt, pension for all farmers above 60, uh, the repeal of the four anti-labor codes that were passed by the current government uh, in 2020, and the withdrawal of the Electricity Amendment Bill 2020. This is among a wider set of demands that cover the entire gamut of the political sphere or spectrum in India today. Protesters accused the Modi-led government of creating a crisis of livelihood for all sections of the working class. The rally was jointly organized by three of the country's biggest organizations or unions which represent workers, farmers as well as agricultural laborers. These are the All India Kisan Sabha, the Center of Indian Trade Unions and the All India Agriculture Workers Union. In the run-up to the rally, an extensive campaign was held across several parts of North India that, ga uh, that garnered widespread support. Workers and farm union leaders held joint conventions in over 400 districts across the country to plan this campaign as well as mobilization. We have more now from Vikram Singh. Right, so we have with us now via video conference Vikram Singh, who's the Joint Secretary of the All India Agricultural Workers Union, one of the three mass organizations, like we were saying earlier, representing uh, millions of uh, members across India's working class uh, who were behind uh, the mobilization, organizing things. Uh, Vikram, for our uh, international audience who is perhaps not uh, very well versed with uh, the specifics of uh, the uh, issues faced by uh, the working class in India today, although many of them are in common with what is going on in the rest of the world, uh, particularly in other countries in the global south, uh, what is the context in which this rally took place? Uh, it's part of an ongoing uh, movement that is now bringing together uh, workers from all sectors. Uh, this rally is a result of uh, some last 10 years' efforts. We are, we are trying to unite the working class, means particularly farmers, agricultural laborers, and workers, organized and unorganized, on their issues. Because from our experience, we have learned and uh, international uh, means uh, people may not be aware, but it is quite uh, evident in India that agriculture is going through very bad uh, time in India. Agricultural labor and workers are forced to commit suicide in 2021, 5,200 50, agriculture uh, farmers and more than 5,500 agriculture workers committed suicide. And on daily basis, 115 workers, uh, daily wage workers are committed suicide. This is a hint. This is a hint uh, about the conditions, uncertainties, and hardships the working class, all uh, sections of working class are facing. And this is primarily due to the neoliberal economic policies adopted by the, our regime, the earlier regimes and the present regime, which is taking it to uh, further, to uh, one step uh, uh, further, uh, particularly using the periods of pandemic when they introduced three, uh, these three farm laws uh, against which a historical farmer uh, movement was there. Uh, during which they implemented four labor code, during which they are trying to uh, give away all the structure of social welfare state, uh, the hard-earned right to work, which is known as Mahatma Gandhi Rural, National Rural 
Unemployment Guarantee Act, I mean, as we call it in India, is the uh, Employment Guarantee Act, which ensures 100 days work to uh, unemployed rural youth, rural uh, people. It is a uh, legal guarantee, but uh, uh, surprisingly, during the last uh, financial year, only for two, two days work were uh, given. So they are taking it uh, away uh, in lack of uh, financial budget from central uh, government. There is continuous reduction. So all this is uh, resulting in miseries in the life of agriculture workers, farmers, and workers. And uh, workers, this uh, toiling masses, from their own experience has learned that there is a common enemy. And the enemy is this neoliberal policies and the people, our central government and our corporates. We call it uh, Modi Shah, our minister and the home minister, and two big corporates uh, of India, Adani and Jabani, they are nexus. They are nexus along with the uh, politics of Hindutva. We call it corporate communal uh, nexus, which are running the India yeah. at one uh, hand. They are implementing these new liberal policies, which are depriving majority of the people. On the other hand, they are trying to divide the unity of uh, toiling masses. So with this understanding, we were trying to unite all the sections of uh, working class. Uh, for, during the last two, three years, we are having a various program. In 2018, uh, we had a big program and then this peasant movement uh, we, where all the sections participated. And now it's a culmination of one phase when um, means lakhs of people, almost uh, 0.1 million people took, uh, participated in uh, this program, which really gave a hope, which is giving a hope not to the toiling classes, but to the whole democratic people who are thinking that this uh, country is still a democratic country. Thanks for uh, giving that uh, quite uh, detailed background, Vikram. Uh, India is going into uh, a next election cycle for its General Assembly. Uh, and like you say, this is just the culmination of one phase of uh, the movement uh, that has been on for a decade of work. Uh, so what next? Where, where does it go from here? And what are the kind of uh, mobilizations and other kinds of political pressure we hope to see uh, in the lead up to the next general election? Uh, we're not saying that we are going into entering into a very important phase that we are entering into the election uh, year. And the whole world is seeing towards uh, the largest democracy of so world, the largest democracy of world. We are an independent, democratically elected government is working in a, an autocratic way. Means um, they are using all government machineries to silent all kind of dissents, including from political to uh, this uh, simple activism. They are not tolerating any dissent. They are uh, doing that in this uh, uh, scenario. When he, when he said that we are just concluded one phase, the second phase is a continuity. There is no phase, basically. There is no phase. is in the continuity uh, from 1st August to 8th August. We are, having, we are going to have a vigorous uh, propaganda, vigorous campaign. Uh, because on 9th August, uh, we celebrate in India as a quit India movement, the legacy of freedom movement where we fought against the imperialist forces. And we uh, we are thinking we are, we are with our understanding is that this government and this regime is continuing those imperial uh, imp uh, imperialist uh, policies in India. So we will be having a vigorous program, all uh, lower level agitation, struggle, mass actions. A, B, central trade unions are going to hold three days strike, ninth, uh, tenth, and eleventh of August. C, uh, C. Sanyukt Kisan Morcha, which is a platform of uh, farmers, they are going to be have a big programs in the month of uh, May and June. So all sections, all sections independently and unitedly will be in the struggles on the basis of the issues of the particular sections. And we think our responsibility is uh, two-sided, two way we will be fighting. First, for the livelihood, for the right of peasantry and workers. And the second, this political fight. Until and unless our struggle, the uh, economic struggle is not converted into the political struggle, we are not challenging this regime. We are not fighting to save our democracy and our constitutional India. We, we won't be succeeding uh, in our the whole aim. So that is our understanding that we will be working against uh, this government, not only this government, basically that nexus 
unholy nexus of political and this corporates along with the blend of this communal politics of uh, bjp so this is, there is a whole uh, year program and uh, we are hoping that uh, our government which is in an illusion that through their skilled mechanism of uh, communal polarization and riding on this uh, uh, election bonds the huge money they are getting from the corporates they will be managing indian democracy they will be managing indian elections they are not going to succeed uh, in this because now uh, working class the creator of wealth the producer of wealth are on the roads and they are challenging this uh, unholy nexus all right uh, vikram singh of the all india agricultural workers union thank you very much for your time and for joining us on daily debrief today next up world leaders and global organizations are expressing concern about as well as condemning israeli vi uh, violence against palestinians at the al aqsa mosque in occupied east jerusalem this is uh, happening during the holy month of ramzan uh, and on wednesday we saw a second day of consecutive raids with some warning that it could further escalate tensions the the spokesperson for the united nations secretary general antonio gutierrez said that the secretary general is appalled by the images he saw of the violence and beating by israeli security forces inside the al qibli mosque in jerusalem jerusalem sorry at a time of the calendar which is holy to jews christians as well as muslims of course other countries and organizations such as germany urged calm while the arab league denounced the aggression calling an emergency meeting as well the arab league called on the un uh, to assume legal and uh, legal moral and humanitarian responsibilities for halting israeli aggression and providing international protection for palestinian people Dr Abdul Rahman is with us to discuss the latest in what is an ongoing spiral of violence against Palestinians. Uh, Abdul we've spoken uh, quite regularly on the escalating levels of violence and oppression being exerted by the Israeli state uh, particularly since the coming of the new coalition government headed by Benjamin Netanyahu also last year being the deadliest for Palestinians. Uh in the month of Ramzan now uh, the holiest month for for Muslims this seems to intensify uh take us through the events of the past few days and and, and what you make of of uh, what's going on despite calls from world bodies and the international community uh, to sort of uh, tone down the kind of provocations well as per the reports on tuesday i think it is well known now uh, on tuesday night when the Uh, thousands of uh, Palestinians were uh, inside uh, the Al Aqsa Mosque compound, uh, basically performing what is called Tarawi uh, prayers. After uh, the five uh, basic prayers, there are additional prayers performed during the month of Ramadan. So, uh, when they were performing that, uh, a set of uh, uh, occupation forces entered Al Aqsa compound and they tried to uh, basically uh, uh, vacate. the space because uh, as we all know uh, along with ramadan uh, this year again there is a jewish festival of passover uh, going on and uh, they wanted to clear the uh, space for the uh, settlers to visit uh, uh, the, what they call the temple mount so uh, uh, because of course the palestinians uh, resisted the attempt to uh, uh, vacate and that led, led to the israeli forces uh, unleashing violence against the palestinians uh, arresting around 400 uh, uh, of them uh, the, the videos are already there in public domain and on social media which shows how brutal uh, uh, the violence was against the people who were basically performing their uh, religious uh, pr performing their religious uh, rituals uh, uh this is nothing new uh, uh, this has been repeated again on wednesday then today also there were reports today means thursday also there are reports that uh, israeli forces have entered they have kind of restricted the entry of palestinians bel below the age of 40 uh, uh, there are uh, reports of uh, 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 several uh, uh, restrictions on those number of people who can perform prayers inside the mosque and when they have to vacate it and so on and so forth uh, if you see the uh, inside the videos uh, which which have come out in public domain they uh, portray how 
uh, the elderly elderly people the people who are performing the prayers while uh, performing their prayers uh, were beaten up how the uh, the property of the mosque were destroyed by the israeli forces and all of this happened uh, uh, with so much impunity and this is happening repeatedly last year also uh, we saw similar things uh, happening thousands of palestinians were injured uh, on the repeated days of violence unleashed by the israeli forces and last to last year also similar things were reported so uh, this is nothing new every year it seems that the israeli forces get some uh, kind of instruction from the uh, occupation authorities to basically uh, 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 vacate the premises it seems of, there are two things which we can make out of all these developments of course there is the fear of uh, uh, an organized uh, uh, palestinian gathering inside the alaska mosque basically uh, uh, create some kind of fear among the occupation forces of course that is one the other thing is uh, uh, we all know that there there were protests going on in israel for last Uh, several months and those protests are still going on uh, uh, palestinians have always been a bait uh, which basically uh, thrown to the israeli people to divert their attention to uh, 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 and to kind of get whatever they want to uh, uh, get so all these things basically is are related to the the uh, larger uh, tactics of the occupation the palestinian lives are uh, disposable Uh, when it comes to the occupation uh, forces and alaksa uh, 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 particularly during the month of ramadan becomes the hot target each year uh, and uh, abdul uh, like you were saying uh, uh, alaksa because of its importance uh, in the islamic world understandably becomes the focal point of the attention as well uh, but this is not something we are seeing uh, it's not an isolated sort of uh, event or location we are seeing this across uh, the board at a time when uh, in a wider sort of geopolitical sense there is also a diplomatic push towards normalization uh, and the whole abraham accords conversation still going on uh, is it the case of uh, another government playing uh, one way within its own uh, sphere of influence and and uh, completely different outside well uh, exactly uh, the point uh, it seems that the uh, israelis are trying to uh, uh, give very confusing uh, 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 message uh, if you see the violence against palestinians since not only since netanyahu came to power has increased it it, it is basically the the escalation of violence against palestinian is going on for many years but in last few years if you see at least 3 years uh, what we see that there are repeated uh, uh, raids inside the occupied west bank where uh, uh, when uh, thou- uh, scores of people uh, hundreds of people each year are killed by the israeli forces and uh, uh, nothing happens a- at the same time if you see uh, uh, the gaza uh, the blockade is still continuing uh, 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 ever since the netanyahu government has come to power the the measure uh, measures against the palestinians uh, Pal- uh, for example one if we if we take one example of palestinian prisoners inside the israeli uh, prisons uh, if you see how the atrocities have been quote unquote legitimized through different kinds of orders passed by the uh, uh, itamar ben gwin who is the uh, uh, national security minister in uh, in the netanyahu government uh, uh, who who himself has been a settler and how settler violence has increased what we, what we saw in huara uh, few uh, weeks ago uh, those things have become quote unquote normal so inside the occupied territories the violence against palestinians uh, <clears throat> has been normalized uh, there is an increasing attempt to normalize it and make it legit in fact uh, but outside it seems that the us and all those backers of the uh, israeli regime they don't seem to bother about it if if you see the new york uh, times heading about alaksa's uh, uh, violence uh, uh, on tuesday they they seems to justify it and this is not the first time they are doing it they have done it before as well so uh, they 
they try to portray it as clash, which is, which is not the case. It is basically one-sided violence against the Palestinians. So this attempt uh, uh, to send uh, confusing messages to the international community is it has been a very uh, 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 well used practice uh, by the Israeli regime, and that is and and uh, fortunately for them. They have uh, backers, uh, uh, powerful backers sitting outside, uh, 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 both in terms of media uh, image and also in terms of the state support by the United States, by the European countries. It seems that Israel is immune to uh, all the violences it, it is unleashing against the Palestinians, and it is uh, uh, still uh, uh, enjoys a, a legitimate uh, presence in the international uh, community, which is basically giving much more scope and uh, uh, legitimacy to the Israeli violence uh, against the Palestinians. Uh, like like Abdul was pointing out, even the United Nations General Assembly's uh, Committee on the Inalienable Rights of Palestinians condemning this attack as the UN has in several forums uh, or, uh, before. But but again, the impunity is actually the shocking part. All right, thanks very much, Abdul, for that update. And we will, uh, of course, continue covering the region as we have been consistently on daily. And finally, despite international high-profile campaigns for his release, Political prisoner Mumia Abu, Abu Jamal's appeal was denied uh, by Philadelphia judge Lucretia Clemens. Abu Jamal has spent over four decades in prison after being convicted of killing a police officer uh, in a politically motivated persecution for his work as a journalist and black liberation fighter. The movement for his release has spanned decades and has grown to international levels. As Angela Davis wrote in an open letter last month, a judge recently ruled that over 200 boxes of materials must be handed over to Abu Jamal's defense after previously unknown or unseen exculpatory evidence was mysteriously discovered in 2018. The evidence relates, relates to Abu Jamal's trial and includes documents that indicate a level of procedural discrepancy that could well constitute a mistrial. This includes jury uh, selection based on racial lines and bribing of witnesses. Natalia Marquez has a detailed report up on the PD website and sent us this take on the continued denial of justice to Abu uh, to Mumia Abu Jamal. So despite the fact that um, for the past one to two months, there's been an international, very high profile campaign for the release of Mumia Abu Jamal, um, his appeal for a new trial was just denied um, by um, Philadelphia judge Lucretia Clemens on March 31st. Um, you know, this is a really devastating blow for Mumia and his supporters. Um, Mumia Abu Jamal has spent over 40 years in prison in the U.S. as a U.S. political prisoner. And um, like many political prisoners in the U.S., he was active in the Black Liberation Movement of the 60s and 70s. He's a former Black Panther. Um, and also, you know, unique to Mumia, he is a journalist who, um, you know, wrote very faithfully about, um, you know, police brutality and corruption in Philadelphia. Um, and his, his um, supporters actually allege that um, his conviction in 1981 of killing a police officer, um, which ge gives cover to, um, um, to you know, his imprisonment as a political prisoner, is nothing, you know, nothing more than a cover and a front for um, persecution, for political persecution, and that there, in fact, is no evidence of him killing Daniel Faulkner, um, Philadelphia police officer. Um, at that time, um, you know, the movement for his release has spanned decades. Um, and um, this was a really recent um, and a really good shot at release for Mumia um, when in 2018, six boxes of previously unseen exculpatory evidence was discovered mysteriously. Um, and a judge ruled in December that over 200 boxes of new evidence um, must be handed over to Mumia Abu Jamal's defense. Um, you know, some of the evidence that was uncovered were documents that indicate that a witness was bribed for testimony, um, that the prosecutor had removed black people from the jury um, for racial reasons, which is illegal, it's unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment, and that the prosecution offered leniency to a key witness um, for crimes that she had been charged with. Um, you know, there's 
Um, not only is, are there notes, prosecutor notes, that show that the prosecutor tracked the race of each juror during jury selection, but also, you know, the trial prosecutor wrote down also in his notes a template um, that he created to select jurors that he, you know, applied unevenly based on the race of the different jurors. Um, you know, um, prosecutors often um, select jurors for um, racial reasons as, um, you know, as a training video from the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office indicates um, from 1986 that black people are less likely to convict and prosecutors want juries that will convict and will have them win the case. You know, this very infamous video um, from 1986 that really revealed um, the strategy of prosecutors in Philadelphia and across the U.S. has many um, really notable quotes, but, but an especially damning one is, um, you know, the person telling trainees um, in selecting blacks to the jury, um, again, you don't want the real educated ones. So this idea that jurors need to be easily convinced um, and gullible and susceptible and also of a certain racial demographic. You know, it's unconstitutional to strike black people from the jury based on their race, but prosecutors often get away with it. And this was, you know, a rare moment where it was actually proven that it was racially motivated by this exculpatory evidence. Um, and yet still, um, Mumia did not get a new trial um, based on that evidence, which is um, pretty incredible. Um, and this new evidence could have given Mumia his best shot at release in a long time. Um, but now, you know, of course, supporters are devastated because Mumia also has a lot of health issues. You know, he's been experiencing medical neglect in prison for over 40 years. Um, and he suffers from heart problems. He contracted COVID. He contracted hepatitis C a few years ago and was denied medical treatment for a very long time. So he, it's not like he has a ton of time left. Um, actually, his, his time is very limited. That's why his supporters want him out of prison as soon as possible. And now, um, you know, this new evidence has really proven unfruitful. So they're looking at things like clemency, etc. But really just hoping that they're able to get Mumia out of prison soon. Um, again, you know, the allegation is that he is in prison for entirely politically motivated reasons. The United States makes a lot out of political prisoners in other countries, really plays up um, political prisoners in countries that it's hostile to, like Cuba and China and, and Russia. Um, but at the same time, um, we in the U.S., we have political prisoners right here at home who are not given opportunities to um, have a fair trial. So, um, you know, at the same time, supporters are going to continue fighting. Um, of course, they've been fighting for decades, um, but it's, it's a really devastating blow. And with that, we bring to a close this episode of The Daily Debrief uh, from Natalia, myself, and the entire team here at People's Dispatch. Thank you very much for watching. As always, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for more details on these stories and all the other work we do. Uh, don't also forget to follow us on the social media platform of your choice. We'll be back same time, same place tomorrow. Until then, stay safe. Goodbye.